So recently I was reminded that Freddie Mercury, the lead singer of Queen, studied illustration and graphic design at the Ealing School of Art, and that he personally designed the band's logo. So today, let's do a little deconstruction of his work and compare the Queen crest with the Queen's crest and ask whose crest is best. Okay, obviously this is comparing apples and oranges. Queen, the band, has a heraldry-inspired logo, and Her Majesty the Queen bears the royal coat of arms. Beyond just design, heraldry is an entire field of study filled with arcane rules and esoteric terminology, and honestly, I'm going to run roughshod over the whole thing. Because heraldry is the kind of niche hobby that can suck you in so deep that you emerge four days later on the other side of a Wikipedia spiral, naked, scared, alone, and never to be invited to parties again. I am no expert on heraldry so we'll just cover enough jargon here to serve our purposes of comparison. First, for simplicity, I'm going to call these crests, arms, and coats of arms. These are all colloquial terms, despite being technically wrong. People do this all the time with design terms like font and typeface, and frankly, I stopped caring a long time ago because it really doesn't matter in everyday conversation. But for the sake of this breakdown, we do need to get down in the weeds somewhat. To illustrate, let's take a look at these arms from the worshipful company of fan makers, a real, still extant 300-year-old pseudo-guild come private members club in London because… of course it is. Regardless of its merits as an institution, they have a great coat of arms, with all the standard trimmings. Heraldry is a very modular system, like a recipe, with several basic elements and a few optional extras in special cases. The shield in the middle is called the escutcheon, and there are various rules for how it may be coloured or divided into sections, with various symbols within each. On either side of the shield are the supporters, here a griffin and a dragon. On top of the shield we have the helmet. This ornamental drapery on the side is called mantling, apparently based on the cloth knights used to wear around their helmet which would be cut to shreds in battle. On top of the helmet sits the torse or wreath, and finally on top of that is the crest. A torse was also a real piece of clothing, a headband of twisted material that kept the crest balanced and in place on top of the knight's helmet. At the bottom, the ground or element under the supporters is called the compartment, and at the very base we have the scroll which contains the motto. This whole thing collectively is called a heraldic achievement, though colloquially we use the word achievement for things earned through merit, not through... So normal folk tend to use the word crest, which is technically only this bit, or a coat of arms, which technically is only this bit. Immediately we see a few differences from the standard formula. Instead of the torse, we have the royal crown, and in addition we get the garter circlet around the escutcheon, with the motto of the Order of the Garter, translated by the official royal website as Evil to him who thinks evil. On the shield we have symbols for the countries making up the United Kingdom, at least for now, England, Scotland, and Northern Ireland. As is typical, England gets half the shield and Wales… You get nothing! Good day, sir! The supporter Dexter is the English lion, and supporter Sinister is the Scottish unicorn. Dexter and Sinister being Latin for left and right, though the convention in heraldry is to orient direction from the bearer's perspective, so like looking in a mirror, the right or Dexter side is to the viewer's left, and vice versa. Fun bit of lore, the unicorn was said to be an untamable beast, which is supposedly why it's depicted in chains. For the crest, we have a lion wearing a crown, standing on a crown on top of a shield depicting seven lions held by yet another lion wearing a crown next to a unicorn with a crown collar. For those keeping count, that's a total of nine lions and four crowns. The mantling here is notable for having an ermine pattern. The ermine, also known as the Armenian rat, is a weasel-like creature favoured by royalty for capes and other ceremonial clothing. 
In winter, its fur goes completely white except for the tip of the tail, which is what these little black markings are a reference to. At the base, we have the English rose, Scottish thistle, and Irish shamrock in the compartment, and we have the motto which translates to God and my right. So what do we make of this crest? Starting with the mottos, and let's just say these are certainly of a different century. I don't think emblazoning a symbol of the state with evil to those who think evil and God and my right strike the right tone for a modern democracy regardless of which language it's written in. Graphically, it's certainly not wanting for lions or crowns, that's for sure. The depiction of these creatures too seems a little uncanny to modern eyes. Of course, these became stylized in a very particular way as visual tropes and conventions became established over the course of centuries, but they're very strange when you look closely. These lions have less of a mane and more of a humanoid beard. Also, the waist to rib cage ratio is enough to make a brat's doll wince. In a post-internet cat world, the tongues sticking out read more as derpy than majestic. That said, things should be understood in context. So here is an older version of the royal coat of arms from 1711 during the reign of Queen Anne. And I think it's safe to say that more anatomically correct animal supporters don't bring much charm to the equation. This coat of arms is deeply terrifying. It's the perfect set decoration for the fortress of an obvious villain in a Game of Thrones style fantasy drama. This lion's face looks as though it just ate someone's face and is eyeing up another snack. It's viscerally disturbing. I'll take derpy Gene Simmons from Kiss Lion any day of the week. Speaking of rock and roll though, let's move on. The band Queen's Crest borrows a lot of visual language from the Royal Coat of Arms with a few twists. In the center, we actually don't get a shield. Instead, we have a crown, very similar in style to the royal crown. Instead of being encircled by the garter, we have a ribbon following the same path but forming a stylized Q. On the sides, we have two lions in very similar poses to the supporters on the royal arms. In fact, the lion on the sinister side wears the same chains as the unicorn from the royal arms, though it doesn't appear to be connected to any kind of collar. The rest of the elements are slightly less familiar. On top of the queue, we have a crab, which unfortunately will always evoke a hot pot restaurant for me. But in fact, this is a Zodiac inspired symbol for Brian May, whose sign is Cancer. The lions represent John Deacon and Roger Taylor, both Leos. Freddie Mercury himself a Virgo, stretches the astrological theme a bit by representing himself with two nymph-like fairies sat on branches at the base. And on top, somewhat disconnected from the rest of the logo, we have a resplendent phoenix rising from the flames. Part of me would like to say that the phoenix is just a little too much, kind of gilding the lily, but then another part of me goes, what part of Queen wasn't too much? Especially Freddy, too much was basically his MO. Critiquing Queen for lacking restraint is kind of like critiquing Flaming Hot Cheetos for their lack of nutrition. It misses the point. But even with the enormous phoenix, this crest still feels pretty well balanced, and for a rock band, it's actually not that over the top. It's kind of a credit that until I was researching for this video, I never realized there was an enormous flaming crab in the middle of this logo. It definitely evokes the theatricality and pageantry of actual royalty without being a simple carbon copy. It remixes elements of heraldry with astrology and mythical creatures and still manages to be visually coherent. That's a pretty big achievement. Of course, we're glad that Freddie decided on a career in music rather than design, but it's clear to see he had a natural talent for the visual arts as well. As I prefaced at the beginning, this is an apples to oranges comparison, so it depends on your preferences. Ultimately, the royal coat of arms is loaded with history and tradition, and how you feel about it largely depends on how much that floats your boat. Removed from its historical context, it's an easy target to roast. The visual frippery and heavy-handed symbolism borders on the absurd, especially when juxtaposed with the modern reality of royalty and its contentious place in contemporary society. 
Queen's logo and even the choice to call their band Queen is at least partially a satirical commentary on this. The bombastic theatrical nature of the band played with the tropes and excesses of the aristocracy in their music videos and built their public image around this flamboyance and pageantry. It was part tongue-in-cheek and part earnest. The logo that Freddy designed fits perfectly into that body of work which the band created, and while it too was of its own time, it will remain iconic. I personally always have a soft spot for the underdog, and that might sound funny when talking about a band full of hedonistic rock stars, but when compared with literal royalty, it's hard not to make that case. As much as I find Corgis adorable, Her Majesty inherited her crest from her father, but Queen they earned all of their achievements. But that's just my opinion. What do you think? Leave your royalist screed in the comments below or send it by Carrier Pigeon. If you enjoyed this video, this channel is all about looking closer at the topic of design. Feel free to check out my other videos. If you enjoyed it, put in a good word with my algorithmic supervisor by clicking the buttons below. My name is Linus. Thank you very much for watching and I hope I'll see you in another video.